Okay, I think we're recording. Um, welcome to our conversation today. We, um, just as a few, the three of us are staff members at Lake Highlands United Methodist Church, wanted to have some um, Christian based conversations about race and justice and um, just thinking about the Christian role and the church's role in that conversation. Um, and if, if others who are not a part of Lake Highlands may be watching, let's yes. remind everybody who we are or introduce yes. ourselves. Um, so yeah, we'll briefly introduce ourselves and then um, get started here. My name is Gretel Roberts. I'm on staff at Lake Highlands UMC as the discipleship coordinator. So it's small groups, women's ministry and newcomer ministry. And I'm married to this guy. And I'm Andy <laughs> Roberts and I am uh, one of the associate pastors here at Lake Highlands United Methodist Church. Amen. And I'm Norman Madao. I'm uh, uh, the director of outreach ministries, uh, also uh, from uh, Lake Highlands United Methodist Church. So the three of us are staff members at uh, Lake Highlands. It, it's like we're family. We're yes. family. Well, and I was we're neighbors, say, too. I know. I was about to say we're neighbors as well. We're neighbors, too. Yeah, I, I saw your mom this morning, so <laughs> <laughs> I waved. <laughs> um, and our kids go to school together too. So together all kinds too. Of yeah. Actions. Um, so yeah, we just want to invite you into this space to listen and learn. Andy's going to start with just a couple verses from scripture, and then I'll offer up some um, questions that you as a listener can be thinking about through this conversation, and then we'll dive in with Norman. Great. Well, so I wanted to take a couple of moments just to talk about a short passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter two. Um, because we want to know that as we're talking about race and reconciliation, that it begins from, a, from the gospel. It begins with a Christian point of view. And so I just wanted to give you a couple quick verses that talk about how Christ is the one that can bring people who are divided together. And so this comes from verse 14. Uh, it says, he, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesians, he, uh, church in Ephesus, he says, for he himself is our peace. He's talking about Jesus. He says, Jesus is our peace who has made the two groups into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so a couple of things just to say about that briefly. I don't want to when you didn't hear, you didn't come here to, to watch a sermon, but, but just to say briefly that the death of Christ, when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, it means a couple of things. Number one, it means it puts us in a right relationship with God, but it also makes it possible for us to be in a right relationship with one another. In fact, Paul says in this passage of scripture that the death of Christ actually tears down the dividing wall of hostility between races. Now he's talking about Jews and Gentiles specifically in this passage of scripture, but we can apply it today. And so the basis for us having conversations about race and reconciliation and how we can be one in Christ is, is the cross of Jesus. It's the cross that, that enables us to be put in a right relationship with God and puts us in a right relationship with one another. So we wanna acknowledge that, that there is a Christian basis for us having these conversations today. So that's kind of what I wanted to say about that, that passage of scripture to give, us, to give us kind of a head start here. And just a quick plug, if you um, are part of our church, you have access to Right Now Media, or maybe if you're listening to this, you know of Right Now Media as well. Tony Evans has a great series um, on there called Oneness Embraced, and his first video on there unpacks this passage in a great way and really illustrates how Christ brings us together. Um, so I would encourage you to watch that. That's Oneness Embraced. He does a Tony much Evans. better job than I do, uh, and he'll go into much greater well, detail. But he had more time. Too. Yes. So just a few quick encouragements um, for you as a listener, just as you're listening to um, this conversation today, I would just encourage you to kind of take on a, an, a, a teachable spirit and a humble spirit to learn what it is that God is wanting you to learn. So what is something that you as a listener need to hear in this conversation? Uh, what do you need to learn from somebody else's experience? And then if our goal as Christians is to be transformed into Christ likeness, what is the Holy Spirit kind of prompting in you through this conversation? So we'll go ahead and let Norman 
go here. We just wanted to start out, Norman, people may not know your story. Um, so as much of that as you would like to share, just talking a little bit about your background and how you came to be in Dallas. Yeah, um, and you know, I've shared my story a hundred times. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes I'm like, I hope I'm not lying so that, you know, it stays the same. Um, <clears throat> so I came to, to Dallas in 2002. Um, and my story is, is, is one that, that might not be as exciting as other stories, but uh, coming from Zimbabwe to, to Dallas, it was mainly because of political situations in, in Zimbabwe. Some of you might know the story of what's going on in Zimbabwe, um, but um, to have the opportunity to leave uh, a country um, that you, you, you have known all your life and you have roots there and it's your, your, your backdrop to everything that you are, uh, it's, it's, it's something that not many of us get to, to do that. Uh, actually, I referenced this in my, uh, my sermon last week. Where, you know, I was talking about Abraham uh, when he was Abraham and he was asked to leave your country, your people. And, you know, so all that just to say, you know, it's when we read it, especially from the Western perspective, uh, we, we, we don't get to experience living your country, your, your people, your language, your food, your, your, you know, how you brought up, but also it leads into maybe uh, also living your spirituality because when you go to a different place, it changes some. Um, and that's kind of what, what also happened to me because growing up even as a Catholic, uh, I'll say uh, it's different. Uh, Catholic practiced in America uh, versus what was practiced in, in, in a place like Zimbabwe. There, there was more of the, the love part, uh, uh, the togetherness part that I kind of missed when I got here and I, I found me a Catholic church. Uh, it, it all went a little sour for me, but um, in a way also because today we're talking about race issues and um, how the injustices, inequalities, and things like that, which is why we are having this this uh, conversation. I'll tell you that uh, when I came over and I started looking for a church to to go to, I went to a local Catholic church. Now I was there for two. I did two Sundays. On the third Sunday, I was in line to receive communion, and I've shared this story before, but for those who do not know. Um, so as you know, you know, I was as pious as they come, you know, I, after all, I'm Catholic and I'm, I'm not just Catholic, I'm almost became a priest um, and, and I've been an altar server. And uh, so I know all the rules. I so I'm walking know. in. Sorry, yeah. I'm pausing. I did not know uh -huh. that you almost became a, that's news to me, Norman. I've oh, known wow. for a long time. Wow. I did not know that you considered going to the priesthood, so. Yeah, I came this close. Uh, I couldn't. I I don't think that was one of my gifts to be celibate. So, okay. <laughs> and and I, I thank God I have four beautiful kids and and beautiful yeah. wife. So, uh, I I'm glad that I didn't go that route. But anyway, on that day, on that Sunday, uh, you know, I'm in line and and we're going to receive communion, um, and then Asha comes over to me and kind of tags on my shirt and, and, and asked me if I was Catholic. I can't even remember her exact words. Um, I, it was kind of a surprise. Um, like she was asking me whether I was Catholic, uh, or whether I knew the rules, or she was, I had done something that made her think like that. But then looking back, even after that Sunday, when I went home and it still played in my head, I thought, how did she pick me out of the whole line mm. of all the people that were there? And then it turned out that I still remember very well that, and I had not seen this from that view, but after this incident, it made me view it from a racial perspective. 
because then I looked at it and I thought, I was in line with my little daughter, Nicole, uh, Pastor Andy, Miss Greater, you know Nicole. She was She's three years old. Yeah, she was our <laughs> yeah. babysitter when our kids were small. She was a baby. So, uh, and, and so kind of surprised me, but then I thought we were the only black people in that line. Mm. Yeah. So how did she choose me for asking whether I was Catholic or not? Uh, so it, I stopped going the next Sunday. And then, so this just to explain how, how even your spirituality can be totally messed up when you move from one place to another, or when there is racism involved in how we make decisions or how we, we approach uh, different people uh, whether it's based on, on I, I can't still tell you right now what I did for her to pick me out of the line because I didn't see her do that with anybody else except that I was the new guy, the only black guy. Right. So, and, and you know, I've always said to people when they ask me about uh, racial issues, I always say, I, I never want to share my story so as to underplay people who have actually experienced worse than me being tagged on my shirt? Or should I also overplay it and say, oh, there is racism and I'm, you know, so I don't, you know, and then the fact that I am, uh, as, a, as a minister in a church, I always know that, you know, like Michael Jordan says, everybody buys <laughs> Nikes. But to me also spiritually, I understand what it means to be for all and to be um, uh, a reconciler of all the people. And I think uh, Paul, as he says, I became everything to everyone so I can reach out to some. And I think sometimes even when you know that you are dealing with someone who does not suddenly look at you in, in the right sense, you, you still have to do what you got to do. And I face that in different perspectives, but um, in some of it, you know, it's where I just say to myself, is this a battle to fight or is this the one to just let go? You know, like if I go to a restaurant and I'm treated unfairly, I got to make a choice. Do I, do I make noise and, and create a scene or I can just look for another one? Uh, but I'll tell you that for, for many, uh, especially black people, uh, the question becomes, uh, how many times do I have to do that for someone to then say it is wrong? Um, you know, it's, it's the story of giving an olive, olive branch and somebody gives you a thorn branch. You know, the exchange is not the same. Uh, so- um, It comes a breaking point maybe a little bit, Norman? Where hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it gets to that such that where we are right now with the situation where we are, um, I speak for the community as a pastor, just like I expect you, Andy, to speak for the community. But I got to say, which community am I speaking for? Mm. Now, I want to speak for the community that is, when we go to the word of God, I want to speak for the downtrodden. I don't care whether that's a white person or a black person or an Asian. Because you see, when we talk about all these racial issues and all that, sometimes we fight as the elite. The elite black people, elite white people, and we all forget the downtrodden. Uh, we're talking about uh, things that affect the world, pandemics. Everybody forgets the downtrodden, mm. the, the, the poor, are always discussed as something that we can use to advance these and we can just put away when we don't need them. Uh, and that to me is, is where I would say, you know, to me, I don't know, it started when I was real young. I've always viewed people as people. And when my spirituality was growing also, my faith in Christ was growing, it seemed to be kind of in tune such that it didn't shock me. And sometimes it wonder, I wonder when I, uh, I, I look at the church where we are right now, whether, you know, if we read the word of God as we should and understand it, how do we view ourselves in the Bible? 
you know, I, I still cannot. And I know you, you had asked about my story and coming to Dallas, but yeah. I know where we are leading this to. So, because my story is vast. Like somebody said, it's like peeling an onion. Somebody said, when you talk to Pastor Norman, it's like peeling an onion. It's got, you know, you got to go uh, layer by layer. And I said, I hope it doesn't make you cry like a real onion makes you cry. <laughs> that was a joke, but yeah, uh, I got, I got. <laughs> I haven't cried yet, but we might. Yeah, yeah. We don't know. We, we, well, we're, well, we're well, again, we gotta be strong for the community because if we right. we are the one breaking down, then uh, you can understand how uh, how it also affects the people around us. But I'll tell you that um, the Bible clearly says we, as a community, man, we we should understand that we are all children of God. Hmm. That's a starting point for any conversation we're going to have. But I don't understand how we have even come to be at this point and still not get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm a scholar. Uh, you know, I love learning things and just paying attention to what's going on and trying to dig back. I I'll tell you that uh, our Christianity has always had problems. Am I speaking to the choir here? Yes. Uh, and our problem no, is that- can I, can I pause for a second? When you say our Christianity, are you talking about sort of American Christianity or are you talking about more even broader History than that? Of time. I'm saying broader than just okay. American Christianity. But of course the American Christianity becomes more of um, a sore thumb, so to speak, uh, particularly because of, of uh, the, the history of slavery, mm -hmm. which you can't separate from the Christianity of America and slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at what also was being used to perpetuate slavery over the, the years, these were the same people who'd go into church and still own sl slaves, and they would say it's biblical. Mm -hmm. right. Now, if you go to the Bible, it says even if you have a slave, treat him like what? Like a human being. But that's not what was going on. But also what I'm talking about here is just, you know, our faith is, is, is founded in our experiences. You, for black people, and I don't speak for all black people, but this is how I understand it. I think church, especially in America, the black church was more of, uh, it started as liberation. There was some 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 liberation that can be found in knowing Christ, in knowing that you can sing songs of liberation. That's why those those Negro spirituals, man, they they can get you to worship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but for the for the white uh, community, they had a different tune to the same thing that was going on. I don't think they would have sang songs that reflect what you hear from Negro spirituals. And you can understand it's because of the differences where we're coming from. Uh, so then it became also that the black church became more of the, not rebellion as such, if I say rebellion, that's the wrong way, but the, the revolution that needed to happen. Uh, and some in the in the white community saw that and could understand even from that perspective and and that's why to me race is such a paradox man and it's it's consuming all of us i said uh in one of my my sermons i said we are all drunk on racism i mean i am just yeah. staggering all over the place because i'm so drunk i don't know where to yeah. where to go uh yeah but I if we could be sober. that a little bit more. Tell, tell us what you mean we're sort of drunk on racism. I haven't heard that term. Unpack that a little bit. I didn't hear your sermon. I need to hear it. So unpack. Yeah, you, and, and, and uh, Pastor Pam remembers that. She wrote it down and said, well, I, I'm, I'm just a, a, an alcoholic in racism, I guess. Right now, that's where we are. We, we all discuss these issues. But how drunk we are is that we can't even get out of it. It's almost like um, an addiction. Mm. We can't get out of it. There, there's a, a part of me that thinks that there's some people who would never want to see it differently than what we have right now. 
And I think that plays into what, what has been said by someone, they talk about privilege, whether they call it white privilege or whatever. Uh, you know, the privilege is something that you don't want to give up. Right. And I think we sort of drank on it uh, in the sense that those who benefit from, say, a racial, systematic racial uh, system that, that gives them the advantage to be whatever, they want it to stay that way. We want to stay drunk on that. But also, there's also some in our communities who want to stay fighting, but not looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. Because it's better that way, we just keep on fighting and we can also blame our, our we can blame it on racism when we can't even move forward. And I, I fight against that where I say, I understand the issues, especially for, uh, for the, uh, the black community to say, but don't let that put you down. Don't let that put you down. Rather, if we, could be, we could have advanced this a long time ago, but we don't because both sides want to stay on the sidelines and scream and shout but nobody's saying there is a solution. And I think the solution should have been found in the church a long time ago. And the church, the church right now is being judged. And I say 2020 is the year of judging the church. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the year of judging the church, seriously speaking, because the pandemic itself, if you, if you recall, I don't remember any other thing that has made us run out of church rather than running to church. The pandemic has made us do this, and then this comes on when we can't be in church, so we can have time to reflect. But what do we mean by church? Why are we even in church if we cannot be together? I, when you were talking, I was you hit what I was going to say is that we we get caught in these polarizations of like, well, I'm going to. I'm going to stay in my position over here. I'm going to stay in my position over here. And we can't come to a solution because neither one of us is willing to listen or to give up a little bit of what we think is the solution. And that's where the church comes in. Like if we do it right, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where the church can come in because Amen. through the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. he brings people together. He doesn't divide. He brings people together. Um, and, but but, but yeah. also to your point, um, uh, we, 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 you know, we, it's like, we don't, we're like a fish swimming in water. We're so used to swimming in the water yeah. that we don't see the water anymore. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's how steeped we are in this, in, in racism. Maybe that's some of what you're referring to this drunk. Yes. The drunk, yes. Like we, yes. we don't even see it because it's, uh, it's, it's just it, the norm. it props us up so much that we, we don't even, yes. we don't even recognize it or see yes. it or realize it. Um, so I, I love how, you know, you know, we are in this place where we're so entrenched, we don't want to listen to each other. What are the, the steps of kind of moving forward? Like how, how, how can the church specifically become more unified? You know, either, you know, listen, we're not going to solve all these problems today. Mm -hmm, we know that. But, but even, you know, in small steps, how can we begin to bridge that gap between, you know, and begin to have our eyes open to, to the issues maybe that we haven't seen before? Any, any thoughts on that, Norman? You know, I always say an injustice to one is an injustice to all. That's a starting point for the church. Um, turning a blind eye or saying, well, it's not in our church or, uh, but we don't have that problem here is essentially saying, I don't want to hear. Um, is that how we should respond though? Yeah. Um, Jesus could have said, I don't want to hear about this woman who is caught in, in, in adultery, but he said, bring her here. So let me hear the story. And, and, and he had, uh, he had a solution that was just as simple as, does any of you here think that you are better than her in any way? And then that was the equalizer. Uh, Matthew 7, 12 says, you know, do unto others what you would want done to you. And I think it applies to black people or white people. It doesn't apply to one and not the other. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in it, it does not say do unto you others who are like you than others who are not like you, it says people. 
that's one thing that you don't find in the Bible. You don't see people labeled as, um, you know, black people, white people. Yes, you have Jews, Gentiles, and you, you reference Gentiles and how we all are now one people. There's no Jew, no Gentile. That means if we truly believe that Christ died for all, man, if God so loved the whole world and gave his son, it, I wish God had just made it so clear to us that no, he only loved the Jews or he only loved, why didn't he even say that? If he said, if Christianity was just meant for the Jews, he could have said, God loves the Jews so much. He, he sent Christ to die for them. He says the whole world. And it means the world of people we have not even discovered yet. We, we all know black people, Asians and all that. Maybe there's some people out there that we don't even know, but he loves them too. Now, I think racism really is the depravity of the soul. When, when, we, we, when your consciousness is taken away, because I wanna ask, uh, and, and I know I'm asking probably the wrong people because I wanna say, I know you too, way too well. But when, when you have lost that part in you, to say someone who, to say to a human being, just because you, you don't have my color, you are not a human being. Regardless, I don't, I don't care whether it's a black person looking, because I've said this before, there's prejudice in all of us. Now, what makes it racism is when you use what you have, your power to suppress others because of their race. That's racism. But prejudice is in all of us. That's why it's also addressed in the Bible. You know, uh, I, I might not like what you eat. And I could say, white folks like this kind of food. I don't eat this. You see, I'm prejudiced against what white people like to eat. And, and guess what? I'm also prejudiced against some black people. I always say, I don't like Nigerian food. Now that's just, we're talking food here, that's simple. Right. But it can go deeper as to say, oh, is that a Nigerian? Oh yeah, they, they, you know, Nigerians are known for being crooks. That's not true. Mm. That's not true. You know, but it could come from my mouth too. Yeah. Though I'm black like them. So prejudice is something we all have. But when we come to uh, understanding that as Christians, man, we, we we got to see ourselves not only on this earth, but in the end. The end gives us a picture that is so different from what we see now, because the end says, you know, I saw a multitude from all races, all nations. And at that point, uh, you know, it, it makes me wonder what, what kind of, do we really think that there will be Republicans and Democrats, there will be uh, whites on this side. No, it does not say. It said a multitude. Uh, I'm represented in, in heaven. I'll be there. I, the question is, will you be there? And we all can be there when we know that Christ is our Lord and Savior. But we cannot say we are Christians and not practice what Christianity is. This world would be so different if we as Christians could actually practice we all are at fault, whether black or white. I can assure you that we are all not living out what Christ has commanded us and commissioned us to. Yeah. I, I think that Revelation passage is And that's so, why we have these issues. Yes. You're right, yeah. right, right. That Revelation passage is so fascinating to me that the, in heaven, the differences don't go away. You yeah. still have the different yeah. tribes and tongues and nations. Yeah. And, like, but there's a unity even in the midst of the diversity. And that, yeah. that too is a model for us today. Like, it's not like we just need to wash away all of our no, differences. No, no, no. And you are, so, you are so right. The diversity is celebrated in heaven. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I always say to people, you, you, you can't, I don't know how you think you're going to live in heaven if you can't practice it right here. Because that would be so different. You can imagine if, if you... If you, you get there and suddenly uh, you're like, uh, where's my people? <laughs> where's the ones? Well, that look like these me? are your people. 
Yeah. And, and one of the things I love about what you guys are doing over at the new room, you know, one of our campuses of, of LHUMC is that you guys, you, it is a little bit of heaven on earth, right? It is a glimpse of it, man. It uh, is a glimpse. Because you're singing, you know, I'm, I just looked up that Roman 7 passage, verse, Revelation, uh, Revelation 7. seven. Yeah, that, 7, that, 9. Yeah, there was a great, great multitude. No one can count. Every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And, yeah. um, you know, so, you know, we know this is our future. Yeah. How can we make this mm -hmm. into our present? You know, that's yeah. that, that's the question, you know. Exactly. exactly. How are y'all, how, how, you know, I know that, you know, you're the second generation pastor. I know that you, you know, filled Pamela's shoes there. But how... Um, you know, how are y'all making that a reality, you know, in the new room? And, 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 you know, that's a great point because, first of all, you got to say, uh, how was the new room formed anyway? Mm -hmm. It's because somebody uh, listened to the voice of God saying, I did not call you out to be cushy and sit here in a church with all people who look like you and call that church. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, you, you can't do ministry to people uh, that are not like you, to people that don't have the same means as you. Uh, and, and like what we have here at the New Room, such that it could be considered easier for me because I look like most of the people who are here. So it could be an easier uh, transition from, from Pam. But I want to give kudos to her because uh, and well, if I say kudos, it's almost like I'm giving her rewards. I know she will get hairs in heaven. <laughs> and I've said to her, sometimes, you know, she's like, oh, you, and I say, your story will not be told well here on earth, but I think it will be told better in heaven because we'll miss out some, some, some details that are very important. Like, in your, and she always say, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I've done this, I've done this. And I said, but God actually considers the, the most important part of you, the purpose uh, he had you here, you, that's what you are doing. Are you doing it the right way? Maybe you're messing up sometimes, but you're doing what you do. So here at the New Room, I'll tell you that it is the burden of love that drives our passion, man. We, mm. it's, and then every day we're almost reminded of how different it could be if we just don't do it this way. Uh, mm -hmm. Or we are also Negative, reminded that- Negatively speaking, how different- Negatively speaking, yeah. 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 But also sometimes, you know, I'll give you an example. And, you know, we have our, our food program as well, which caters to all people. Uh, you know, I have had some, some, some people come. And so one time I had a lady show up and so I was trying to tell her how we do things and how we're going to do this. And she literally dismissed me and said, I want to talk to the supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course she was Caucasian. So, uh, and I'm saying this to, to kind of reflect on what we're talking about. So she said, I want to talk to, I want to talk to the supervisor. And of course she wanted to run to, the people who looked like her. Right. Uh, and I, I said, oh, if you want to talk to the supervisor, it is I who is talking to you. <laughs> I'm the man. I'm yeah, the so man. I am the man. <laughs> she said, well, I will just wait and talk to her and point it to somebody else. So it was like, okay. So I, I made a point and I said, well, here's the unfortunate part. She can't serve you unless I tell her to serve you, because I am the boss. Um, so she, she, that kind of put her in a, you know, uh, and, and everybody said, well, Pastor Norman has told you, so you wait your turn. And she just wanted to jump the line and cause issues because, but here's the flip side. I also have somebody who show up and say, I don't want to talk to any of these ladies dismiss them because she's black. She wants to talk only to me. So I've had to say, lady, I am not here to serve you. They will save you because that's what they do. And they, they've taken their time to come and volunteer to help you. 
you should consider that also. So uh, every day something happens that shows us that this thing is in our heads, man. Yeah. There was no need for her to say, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to those. Or for this other one also to say, I don't want to, I want to talk to Pastor Norman only. There's no need, but this is the background we are having to work with. Yeah. It's like we just have our preconceived notions of what, how people are going to be or what, how they're going to act. And we're, it's more comfortable to stick with people who yeah. think the same way that yeah. we do or look the same way. Exactly. And I always say if your church, uh, and I know I'm talking too much, but if your church does not have problems, it's too perfect to be a church. Mm. Uh, wow. Just think about that. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, uh, man, this is church. Yeah. Peter, yeah. this is church. When I go home, and, and and last night somebody called me and said my AC is not working. I, I was talking to you about a water heater this morning. I forgot to say last night I had another call. The AC is not working. Now. And I'm sitting at the dinner table. I'm like, okay, so I got to think now, do I go get her a fan or do I even ask her to come over to my house because she got two little kids? I'm thinking, there's no way, it's hot. Uh, but then I, I, I kind of advise her, did you call the maintenance people? Uh, call again and say, it's an emergency. My, I got little kids. And then she, and I, she called me 30 minutes after and said, they're coming, they say they're coming. And then two hours later, she said, it's fixed and she thanked me but most importantly she said we praise god for you that's the prayer that i just want people to have for me to thank god not just to thank me so uh, that's church yeah that's real I, church i love that phrase that you said a little while ago the the burden of love drives our passion i've never that's the first time. I don't know if you meant to say that, but that was powerful, man. Um, what a statement. The burden of love drives our passion. It reminds me of something, you know, that, that Dr. King said about, you know, hate, hate is too great of a burden to bury, to, to, to bear. bear. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, but, but love is a burden that to drive our passion and all of it. And particularly exactly. I'm hearing you say it's, it's it's because Jesus loves everyone that we're called to love everyone, even when it's painful, that. yeah, even when it's hard, yeah. uh, because people are worth loving because every every you know because everyone matters. Exactly, love uh, your enemies, love your the unlovables. I mean, it's, it's that's the hardest thing. I mean, to love a person who just doesn't care about you. But I think love can change a lot of things. Love is the transformative word that is the Bible. Uh, because in the Bible, it's all about love, the love of God. But it, it's also filled with other stories. But the real story in there is God so loved the world. Mm. But also, love can do these things. Yeah, I know about, you know, the, the great chapters where we, we read about love and how it can cover over multitudes of sin. Love is just, love can take away a lot of things that we fight over and we look, you know, I always say if I have love and I walk over to you, Andy, and I've never seen you, but there's love in me and I start showing you love, that can take away a lot of what you already have. And, and can you imagine how much I can free your soul by showing you love? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's where we, we all stack on because we don't have that. One day I was at a, at a place, I, uh, you know, and I was buying some, some material uh, for building something. And I needed uh, these, these uh, you know, I was buying some wooden boards and I needed them to be 12 feet. But the, the place said, we don't have 12 feet. We got 16s and, um, but you can pay for 12 and we just get, and I said, ah, you know what? It's okay. Just give me 16s. Uh, then when they went to get them, they said, oh, we're out of 60s. We now have 18s. And I said, no problem. Bring them. Then I look at my little truck. <laughs> they were not fit. So as I'm trying to think, what do I do? And I had 36 of them. 
And I thought, oh, I have a little saw, a hand saw in my, in my truck. I got to cut all these 36 into what will fit in my truck because the rest of this I don't need. And now there's a guy, and I'll tell you, in the world that we live in, I would, I would describe him as a redneck. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just saying. So say I see him, he's watching me and he, he sees all this playing out and he can see, there's no way you're putting those 16s in your little truck. And he walks over and he says, what are you trying to do? Cause he sees me with the little head. So, and I got 36 of these to cut. And he said, what are you trying to do? I said, man, they gave me, a, it's, it's like, uh, do you have a, a power cord? And I'm like, yeah, I do have one. It's 50 feet long. It's like, let's see if we can find somewhere. He connected it, got his uh, saw, whew, cut those for me. And, and he said, do you need help loading this? Now, this is a guy I would not have walked to, to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Prejudice. Yeah. I would not have walked to him yeah. for anything. I was prepared to cut these by hand. And he came over and did this. So when we were done, uh, you know, it's, it's coronavirus. So, and, and I said, brother, I would have given you a hug, but you know, and he dropped the, the, the saw that he had in his hand and just oh, hugged me like, here. yeah, like, yeah, it's okay, man. <laughs> and I was like, yes, oh, yeah. Got, and and I wanted to hang on to that hug because, mm-hmm. and I left there and I shared the story with uh, some of our outreach staff. And I said, that, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. And I, I think also he walked over because maybe in my spirit, I didn't hate him in my spirit. I've always also looked at other people and shown that I want to help. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't believe in all that karma stuff, but this is what happens when you love people, love comes to you. And that day I needed somebody to love me. And I'll tell you, the very people I would have thought would have helped me, my Hispanic brothers who were also there, they just kept on walking around me doing their thing. This guy from afar walked over, did this for me, and it gave me hope. It gave me plenty of hope that the person that I consider a bad person just because of how he looks is not. He got plenty of love. I wonder, I wonder if that's how, you know, the folks responded when they heard Jesus tell the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, they, they, were, they were surprised. That cut, it so, cut them to the chest. That, the, that the Samaritan yeah. could display that kind of love. They weren't expecting that, and it just surprised them. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, and it, it shows how love removes those walls. That's and exactly why we're talking about this. Exactly, and exactly. It, those walls are gone. Yeah. yeah. When, when I can have sensitivity and care for what somebody's going through, then the wall gets taken away. Like, I'm just thinking of you as a person. Um, just, it also, you referenced 1 Corinthians 13, that passage, and so much of that passage is inconvenient mm-hmm. <laughs> and difficult. Yeah. And we can't do it without the Holy Spirit, ultimately, because love yeah. is hard. Like, love is not just an easy emotion that we feel it it takes getting outside of ourselves and I just this whole conversation the last couple of months I just keep coming back to empathy to like if I can't feel the pain of what somebody else is going through then like that's got to be the starting Mm -hmm. point Mm -hmm. I have to have Mm -hmm. some compassion for Mm -hmm. what other people are going through I was thinking about empathy and I was also thinking about proximity because of that I mean, this guy just saw you and he, he saw you in the parking lot yeah. and said, I'm going to go help this guy. So, yeah. you know, the neighbor, the person you love is the person that you come across yeah. in your pathway. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Luke 10, parable of the good Samaritan mm-hmm. teaches that's us. The good Samaritan, yes. It's just love, love that happens at the moment. And at the uh, moment. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Because remember, the question also was, who is my neighbor? Right. That was the question posed because, yeah. you know, you'd be like, who's my neighbor? Oh, a guy who looks like you. No, it's the guy whom you encounter because you see my soul, when it encounters another soul, that's just like God has walked towards God because we are made in the image of God. 
how can I not see God in the other God? It, not to say we are gods, but I'm saying my soul should gravitate towards another. It's like if you were lost in a, in a, in a forest somewhere and you've been wandering for, for days and you are white and the first person you see is black. Imagine that. Or if you were black and the first person you see is white. Imagine that. Yeah. Would you say, no, nah, I'm waiting for other black people to come <laughs> find me? <laughs> or you'll be the first one going, hey, I don't speak your language or whatever you do, but please. And that's when, that's when also you see that we are made in the image of God. Because at that point, it don't matter whether you speak the same language or not, you'll find a way to communicate. Right. And there'll be a way to communicate. Right. Human being, human being. But once we lose that humanity, when we lose the humanity, now here's where the fallacy is. As Christians, we've lost humanity, but we think we have it. Mm -hmm. That's why I says that the racism is really a depravity of that humanity in us. When we have lost that, we, we're just doing church. This is play. We're not doing real church. Real church still has to have that component that says, man, whatever it takes, I will be your brother. You are my brother. Mm -hmm. I'll be the neighbor. Proximity. I like when you say proximity. And how can I know, uh, you know, this is a question that I hear from most of my friends who are not of my color. They ask, what can we do? Great question. I always say, great question. I say, why haven't you been doing it? <laughs> now that's, that's kind of putting a burden back on them. And then they're like, well, because you know, I've read, and I say, but if you are a Christian, that's the first thing you should have realized because especially when someone says, I don't see the racism that they're talking about. I don't see the injustice. Well, I know some people uh, and they are okay. And I say, mm, you don't see it because you don't want to see it. Hmm. You don't hear it because you don't want to hear it. Or perhaps you, because it's all on your side, you, you enjoy the, you know, it's like uh, you, you grow a, 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 your grapefruit and, you know, the grapes start happening on the neighbor. Uh, you be like, yeah, but, you know, it's all good. No, it's not good because I'm not getting any fruits on this side, but, you know, so some people are benefiting from the status quo of saying, let's not even go there. And then you wonder also when we say, why do we still, oh, you know, people always mention um, the crimes and the things that other people do. And I say, all it takes is the reverse of that. Yeah, your community could be doing the same. Yeah. Wow. But you just don't want to look at it that way. You don't want to wear my shoes so you can walk in it for a minute and see how that can be. You know, somebody once said, and, and it, I don't know if that is even necessary, but somebody said, I wish there could be a reversal. I think somebody has done a documentary or, or a movie on what if uh, white people were enslaved? Just yeah. so that they can learn something. Let it be just for two minutes, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we joke about that. It doesn't have to get to that point if we are Christians. That's my point. Yeah. You don't have to be enslaved for you to see how you got to read the word of God. And if you believe what you're reading, and if you trust what you're reading, and if you are convicted by what you're reading, where is the transformation? Yeah. You yeah. see, racism will never go away in America as long as black people are the ones asking for the change. Right. It takes wow. all of us, but more so it takes the one who has not seen it because we keep saying that, or the one who has benefited from it saying, no, I understand because the, the misunderstanding is always when someone thinks it means taking away what I have. No, it means pulling your brother up and it, it might take us another hundred years anyway but it's just pulling so it, the american system says we are all equal we have justice for all education is free for all 
this and that, but that's not true. We all know it. This is a subversion of what, you know, it, we, we just changed something, and, and, but we didn't really change um, a lot. Yeah, the, the root. But the problem. root is not, yes. Well, man, uh, we could keep going all day and um, we love listening to you and we've learned a lot. I'm glad you're my brother. I'm mm -hmm. glad to be in ministry with you and um, we love you and just so thankful for you and your family and the chance to talk today. Um, so, hey, before we, before we close, uh, what is one, you know, sort of resource, either a book, podcast, movie, something that you would you would suggest to folks who are watching this maybe that now, maybe now well, the other part that, that i never tell people is that i used to work in movies uh acted <laughs> in movies and worked behind the cameras and all that again the onion is being peeled now that's you another forest gump like norman you're the forest gump, <laughs> forest gump. i don't know if you've ever seen forest gump i don't know if you should see it but but like everything that could happen to you has happened to you i know Amazing. i know but uh i wrote a book uh a long time ago it's called white farmer black warrior mm. now as you can tell white farmer black warrior it already has a racial tinge to it uh not a great book to read i wouldn't recommend to anyone because i wrote it but also it it's a reflection of uh, uh the zimbabwean racism or racial uh relations uh in 2000 or at least it, in these years that we're living now. But you know, Zimbabwe also came from a, a time of apartheid, which was in South Africa. And I know everybody knows about South Africa more because at least they had Mandela, uh, who is a larger than life kind of figure. But uh, in Zimbabwe, we had almost a similar situation where my parents uh, growing up, they, uh, my dad would not walk on certain streets because he didn't have a paper that his employer would give him to allow him to walk in that area. If you don't have that, you are trespassing in your own country, by the way, mm -hmm. wow. in your own country. Uh, but they, then that all went away and, uh, but again, just like the American system, slavery was abolished, but the system did not change much and it manifests itself again. So in my book, I'm also playing, it's, it's a little drama of the same thing where we gained independence, but nothing really changed. Mm -hmm. Until now, people had to use a different way to say the same, to say, we were fighting to be independent. We are not independent. So they had to use a megaphone to shout even more. And then it became a racial tension because the white people in Zimbabwe still owned everything that they owned before independence. So the, the economic situation didn't change for the black per person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, wow. there you are. So it's the same way we see here. So in that book, I, I, I can recommend it. Don't, don't, yeah, if you want to read something. But watch Selma. Watch Selma. I think, Miss Gretel, you might have watched Selma. Yes. But Selma is talking about voting rights. And we see how voting rights could change a lot of other things. But you know that that whole, uh, it become a bloody mess, so to speak in English, a bloody mess. Because you don't wanna give up the rights to control who votes and who doesn't. Right. There's power in that. Yeah. There is power in that because once you have your people, you can maintain the system. But if you have the right people, you can change the system. Mm. So there's one side of America that would fight to make sure that they control the voting system and it's still going on. It's still going on today. I'll tell you that, and I speak for the community, more black people have it so hard to vote than any white person. I don't know why, why that happens, but then that person who ends up in power represents all of us. And I'm like, you can't, if I didn't let you go in, and also those who voted you in might have had their own agendas that are not, uh, you, you're not going to 
represent me on. So same thing over and over. I don't know which generation wants to change things, but I think the generation that we're looking at today is about change. Yeah. Uh, and as a church, we, we got to make sure we're on the right side of history here. We, 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 we have, this compromises our witness as a church. Racism does compromise our witness. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sorry to say, that's just uh, the evaluation I would give to the church. We are compromised. If we don't see it, we are lost. Yeah. Well, thanks for helping to expose that today. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, that's that's our hope in these conversations that we're having is to is to keep exposing that so we can keep learning and growing and and figure out how to live out that unity in Christ and 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 uh, be stronger, not weaker. Uh, yeah. Through all stronger of that together. Yeah. I was, so, I was yeah. just thinking too the the prayer that I'm coming away from this with is just praying for open eyes to see where we're at fault see where we could be better especially going back to the beginning of like the church was part of establishing slavery like mm -hmm. we can't that's painful to say but colonialization i mean we were colonized again when they came to colonize africa they had the bible in one hand that compromised christianity in, in most parts of the world uh the spanish inquisitions you know all that stuff uh we and then you say how were you reading that where were you finding yeah. that so again people can read the bible and, and interpret it in that way but when you do it in truth and spirit you'd find there's no place for racism in the bible behold the new man is here the old is gone right. there's neither jew nor gentile nor female nor male a slave or free, we all equal. Amen. Yeah. And we are ambassadors for Christ as, as a ministry of reconciliation that we have. It says that as if Christ, as if God is 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 pleading mm -hmm. through us, you know. So I wonder if if we are carrying that message well as a church. We can do our part, and we are doing it even in this conversation. Uh, uh, and and you know, it's the, the New Room Church, it's Lake Highlands United Methodist Church. I see lots of hearts that desire to see change. Maybe we just don't have, uh, we haven't discussed yet, how do we do it? And that's where you two come in and you have decided to do this. And I'm grateful that you, 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 you let the spirit lead you to discuss this. Um, and, and that's the prayer that I also have that, this does, just doesn't become one of the discussions because I can assure you there have been discussions for 400 years, but this becomes more practical. And we cannot say, oh, just because we are, we are few, the few of us or uh, who are we, we are not officials of any kind. No, we can make a change in our little neighborhood, in our little families, just like we are doing here at the New Room. This community here, runs here i mean someone comes to just ask to charge a phone because they know at the church they will help me mm -hmm. that's the difference you can make yeah. one person at, at, at a time or one little community at a time then it flourishes but if we try to eat the whole elephant at mm -hmm. once chances are we'll die before we finish this elephant but we can eat a leg at least let's eat the leg one 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 parking lot encounter at a time at a time yeah yeah and carry that and carry that in your heart and let that be the testimony of the people because you know people come to know christ not only through the words that you're going to say but the testimony of the people because if i tell you that god actually loves me god can move mountains i want to hear the story of how he moved mountains mm -hmm. then i know that for sure he can move mountains and that, that, that is uh, uh, the part of the faith that we should carry for with us to say, yes, mine is this little, but I, we can move this mountain called racism. Not called racism, it is racism, where we don't uh, consider each other as human beings mm -hmm. based on color. It's a mountain, but our little faith 
one day we'll move it. We just got to start practicing now. Hey, would you, would you close us out by praying that God would remove that mountain of racism? Yes, let's go to prayer. All right. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we, I thank you, especially today. I thank you for you ordained this day to be uh, a day that we, we, we come together to discuss this. Yes, where there's two or three of us, we know you're in the midst of this. Uh, we come humbly, Lord, to, uh, before you, just thanking you for your spirit, your Holy Spirit, who gives us passion, um, who opens our hearts and our minds to the revelation that you have given us. And may we carry this revelation to the ends of the world carry it with power, with the encouragement of the word of God that says we, we have been given a spirit of power, not that of timidity. Uh, may we confront this mountain that is in front of us. May we confront it with faith that says one day it will move. Use us, oh Lord, use us. Like all the old saints in the, in the Bible who always answer the call and say, here I am, send me. May you send the three of us and all those who are going to join us in moving this mountain. May we all be united in knowing that you love all that you created and you created us all equal. And I thank you, Father. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Norman. You're yeah, welcome. We appreciate you and we'll carry on the conversation and we'll also be looking for ways to live this out. And I had promised myself that I wouldn't cry, but I guess it comes the time. That, well, good. That That's good, man. We, we need to be shedding the tears right now. Yes, we do. And yes. See, there's the timer going off saying we got to stop. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, oops. Yes, sir. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you all for, for indulging me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for your time. I never, I never know when I'm, I'm useful to anyone. <laughs> you are. You are. Very useful. Sure. We are so thankful, man.